Samantha Knights! Hi there! Some of you may remember this pretty lady. This is my mom. Hi. Uh, she has a YouTube channel, uh, Dealer4519. I will do my best to leave a link in the description. Um, and we're actually going to talk about something that you've talked about on your channel previously. I don't know if I had... Well, um, yeah, but... A little bit, but not is... these particular right, topics. Right, right. Um, so, look, uh... I would say at this point, like two years ago, I decided that one of the things that I want to do on YouTube is I want to tell stories. Interconnected stories, but stories nonetheless. Because in my personal opinion, we all have a story. We all have many stories that we want to share. Some that maybe we don't want to share, but if they get lost to time, I think it does the world a disservice. Today, I want to do talk about um, a little bit of history that involves both of us, grandma. My grandmother, your mom. That's right. And I wanted to sort of put down into, like, into stone, so to speak, sort of the history of my grandma that we have been able to derive. Now, to be fair, there are a lot of secrets, a lot of sort of twists and turns and unknowns. So some of this is what we've been able to put together. Because grandma was very much one of those, like, let's not talk about our feelings type people. Exactly. Um, and, you know, let's, you know, let's not talk about the things that are inconvenient. That's right, because if we don't talk about those things, potentially they'll go away. Now, we know that isn't true, but that's how she pretty much lived her life. So, my grandma, your mom, um, let's, may we just call her by her first name so we're not doing the mom-grandma thing? Yeah, Joan. Okay, so, Joan. Uh, Joan was born when? 1941, May 19. 27th, 1941. Okay. And she was born, she was a, what do you say, like a third string immigrant? Her parents weren't immigrants, but... Her grandparents, her grandparents were okay. immigrants. Okay, so immigrants from where? That's interesting that you should ask me that, because I did a DNA test, ancestry, and I wanted to find out, <clears throat> so I don't know who my father is, and we're going to get to that in this video. You do good and, much, Dave. Yeah. But he plays too rough. Um, but anyway, I wanted to find out where else my family could be from, where the other half was, the other side was from. So it came back that it's that my entire family is from Northern Europe, Northern Asia, Sweden over, past Russia, up to where the Vikings came from, all of that. But that's interesting because it, they, none of them were from Finland, which is what I would have told you before today. Um, since none of them were from Finland and my grandfather's parents moved from Finland to here and spoke Finnish, what that has to mean is that they migrated at some point from the Viking country, Sweden and Russia, over to Finland and then moved to the United States. So for whatever reason... Maybe they thought it would be easier to come so, here. Just because there was nothing genetically linking them to that area doesn't mean that they didn't live there for maybe even a few generations. Exactly, because where you, my, my genes lead me, Sweden, I don't live there. So, that's true. So, alright. So, the simple version of that is Sweden and Finland. The complicated version is Sweden, Finland, and who the hell else knows where. Right, but it's all Northern Europe and Europe and Asia. Joan was... Um, she was the oldest, right? Yes, she was the oldest of four daughters. Okay. Now, these daughters... So we've got Joan. Joan. And then, almost four years later, we had Janet. And then uh, three or four years later, we had June. And then, later, we had Jean. So, so Joan... Uh, I'm not going to do this in order. Joan, Janet, Jean... Nope. I said I'm not doing it. Oh, oh, okay. Joan, okay. Janet, Jean, and... Joan, Janet, June, and June. June. I, I, I missed June. The one, the redheaded. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. she's got dark and red I hair. Really like that, I, I love Aunt June. Anyway, all right. So, obviously, <laughs> Grandma had a thing for the letter J. Great, great. Well, your great grandma. Yeah. Right. And in keeping, while we're on that subject, her daughter Jean, their daughter Jean, has, in order, Tracy, she, she passed away, but Tracy was the firstborn. Kara was second, Troy was third, and Tanya was fourth. While they had a boy thrown in with their girls, they stuck you know with what the I letter just realized? T. 
yeah. in a couple of generations, if YouTube is still a thing, somebody may be able, somebody either related to us or potentially our kids, grandkids, whatever, could use this for genealogy yeah. research. She was the eldest of four. Her mom and dad, that's Signe and Ralph, Ralph um, they... Signe is a very uh, Swedish name. Mm-hmm. So so they um, they owned a farm. Yes. And they were on, I think you told me at one point, 114 acres. Yes. Um, that's a lot of farmland. That is. That's a lot. Um, probably, you know, 60 of it was wooded. Maybe even more than 60. So they didn't... Uh, it was in the upper peninsula of Michigan. And when I, I mean, I'm saying it is, you know, 25 minutes from Lake Superior, so it's way up there. The U.S. government's national forestry bought most of that land at, at what wooded values are, which is like, you know, almost nothing. Yeah. But... Um, it's eminent domain, and the American government can come wherever you are and buy your land for whatever it appraises for, and you have to sell it to them, and that's basically what happened. But they were left with the land that they farmed, and they were left with like 20 or 25, 30 acres of hunting land where yeah. you could go for deer and stuff because you can't, you can't hunt wolves or bear. But. So Grandma grew up on a farm, yep. taking care of her siblings because that was very much what was expected back then. Right. And this isn't a very densely populated area. Oh, this no, is no my okay. So the the great part about knowing where your family came from is knowing what side of the road they lived on. So as you traveled from the highway, which isn't really a highway, to my great grandmother's and grandfather's house, once you turned off the highway, my grandfather, including my grand my okay my grandfather's family, including my grandfather and my grandmother, owned the right side of the road. And my grandmother's family, sisters, brothers, they owned the left side of the road. So at one point, no matter how far up or down you went on that street, they were they were all family. Your aunts, your uncles, your cousins, your grandparents, all of them. Yeah. So now this, I think we mentioned before, it was in Michigan. Michigan yeah. is not known for being a warm place. Oh, no. Do we know what our, at this point, you know, our ancestors, what our family did with that land? Uh, they rode snowmobiles when they, were, when they became available. <laughs> I'm sure they had snow fights. Uh, but they were farmers. They were crop farmers. So, yes, they had cows, they had horses, they had chickens. I remember those. But that was for their own use. That was not... It was They didn't sell that. They, mm-hmm. they harvested crops and sold them. Now, an interesting side note here. My grandfather's sister, Mabel, they lived like... I know, 150, 200 miles away in Wisconsin, and they had a huge dairy farm. So she went on to marry a man who moved her to Wisconsin, and they had a huge dairy farm, you know, like, you know, hundreds of, hundreds of head of cattle. And even in the 70s, as I can remember them, they had milkers. They didn't milk 250 cows themselves twice a day. They had milking machines. And a truck came every day, a big semi pulled up and drained their tank of milk every single day. Um, So, actually, I think farming was in their blood. Grandma, look, the farm life, especially back then, was a tough life. That means you may have a pet pig one week, but that's food the the next. next, Right. Um, But actually, you don't have a pet ear of corn, and that was sort of... (laughs) Well, and and I bring that up, not, you know, um, not really just because, I mean, that is, you know, important, you know, because that... That, that, I'm not going to say it takes a toll on you, but that informs some of your it, your decisions and stuff later on in life when you are... Not informed, but it, it yeah. definitely... When you're confronted uh, with that early on, from early on in life, you know, there are people, I'm sure, that are living who don't, who may consciously know that turkey is, comes from an animal, but who may have a little bit of an issue actually to doing the deed. Yeah, sorry about that. The about camera this. cut off. So gotta... um, remember, I told you that the animals were their food and stuff, and they had chicken house, chicken house, and like. Well, um, when I went up there, I remember my grandfather telling my mother that he was going to have to teach me how to cut the head off a chicken and bleed it out, oh, no. which really you cut the head off a chicken and you throw it and it, it runs around, run. and all the blood comes out Ugh. because it's running around. 
It doesn't run long, but it does. But, you know, I had to ask that question because, no, he did not do that while I was there. He did, however, teach me how to split wood because mm -hmm. he went up in the woods and I'd go with him to get away from Grandma. We'll hear about that later, too. Yeah. Um, to get away from my Grandma, I'd go with him and we'd do chainsaws, take down two, three trees, and we'd put them on, you know, drag them back to the farm, and then we'd cut them up and I learned how to split wood. I was eight. I was eight in that. Here's something interesting. You and I had a little bit of a conversation earlier, and I wanted to bring this up because I thought it would be interesting to explore. Mm -hmm. Now, with four daughters living on a farm, that sounds like a like a a really conservative way to grow up. And I'm assuming the church was a big part of lives. But here's the, the interesting thing I found that you told me was that. That grandma and grandpa didn't attend, but they dropped the girls off every Sunday. Yeah, and um, I've never studied, a, I've studied religion. What I haven't studied is religion from Sweden and Finland, but what I know is I, my grandma and grandfather never attended church. Never. Not with the kids. They were dropped off and picked up, dropped off and picked up, dropped off and picked up every single Sunday, and in fact... For two people who didn't attend church, and that's what they were, it's odd because they raised them Lutheran, which means they had, when they started school, I guess they were seven or so, they started their, their CCV classes or whatever the Lutheran is of that, but, but they had to be confirmed and get confirmation and all that stuff into the church. And, and it, it affected my mother. Now, my mom did the same thing with me. To, she baptized me Methodist and took me to any church I wanted to go to, dropped me out and picked me up. But she told me that the, only, that the reason that I asked her, why wasn't I raised Lutheran? And she said, I never wanted you to be raised Lutheran. And that was that with that. I don't know if she attributed, I don't know. I'll never know, but she definitely said that. That was not what she wanted. She just kind of decided to go a different way. Okay. Right. Being, a, being a child raised on a farm, I'm sure grandma at some point started operating the, mach the machinery. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, she was, you know, young, probably eight, nine, ten years old. And to get away from Grandma, now we are talking my mother wanted to get away from her mother. This is true. Um, she said to get away from Grandma, she started hanging out with Grandpa, and she would do the farming. So, the not only drive so the tractors. Joan to get away from her mother. Right. Now, as far as I know, the only thing wrong with my grandmother was she was strict well, she was a drunk, but skip that because she quit drinking when she was you know, in her 60s. But, well, she was a diabetic in her 60s. That's why she quit drinking. But she was strict. She never, ever lost her Swedish accent, not to the day she died. I could barely understand her, and I could only understand every three or four words. So, um, but my mother said that to get away from, you know, her bitching and harping and, you know, and honestly, I think it was to get away from her sisters. Because remember, every three or four years, my grandmother popped out another shot. Uh, so, and grandma had, she was doing the like the proper big sisterly thing and trying to help take care exactly. of. Exactly. Okay. And that's not her, she didn't want that. But I mean, if you think about it, from the time they, they, walk, they, they walked to school, or they, they were taken, but that school was like 15, 25 miles away. They had to go to a Ewan County school. And I don't even know if Bruce Crossing, Michigan is in Ewan County, but it was Ewan High School. So, having said that, um, you know, she was in charge of those kids all the time because, well, just because she was the oldest and my grandmother did work as a bartender, my grandfather drank as a farmer, then my grandmother drank, so if they weren't drunk, they were hung over, and if they weren't drunk and hung over, they were, you know... Yeah. Not being parents, apparently. So, to get away from her sisters, my mother, and not only did she do farming with Grandpa and wood cutting and all that stuff, but she learned how to manage a chainsaw, because we know we've seen, yep. we saw her do it when we were younger, for she was still alive. And she also learned how to work on engines, tractors, and then cars, trucks, you know. So, she was, she was very handy that way. We've gone over the fact that she could drive a tractor and, and all that stuff. Uh... Something else interesting about sort of the area and way that she brought up, she was brought up, she got her license at an early age, didn't she? Yeah, um, back when she was young, and I don't know what the law is now, but uh, kids got their farmer's driver's license at 14. So, if she was ever stopped 
she had shown that and explained that in some she way was she farm was business. on farm business. She was delivering something to somebody. Going to pick something going up. Going to pick something up for the farm, basically. That was that okay. was what, what she did. Um, let's but see. by the same token, she also got to drive the kids to church, so my grandparents no longer had to do that. So once my mom turned 14, it was pile everybody in a vehicle except the baby. Remember we talked about the gap between my... Mm -hmm. So my mom was 14 years old when my Aunt Jean, who was born in 55, was born. So there was enough of a gap there where she only had two at that point. And then a few years later, I'm pretty sure that's why she graduated from high school and left home. We'll get into that so in a minute. So it's, it's hard for me, right? Because I was, I was born in 85-ish. And ish. Ish. Give or take and, a day or two. Yeah. Right? So I was born in 85-ish. And uh, so it's hard for me, looking back, like, it sounds to me like we might as well be talking about the days of, like, one-room schoolhouses and, okay, we are. and all that. Okay, so it was, because in 1941, Pearl Harbor was attacked. In 1945, we went to war in Europe, and then we went to war um, uh, in the East. You know, we, we went over there to take care of Japan, so... You know, we had two different wars. We were fighting on two different fronts in 1945. By that time, my grand my my grandparents were having their second child. So this is the this is the time where we had had we'd already had the uh, stock market crash, and people were just rebuilding from that. Banks were you know afraid to loan out money for you know anything, let alone farms and houses and stuff. So yes, this is the day where even a lot of girls didn't get to finish school, and that's true. That my grandparents had four daughters graduate from high school, sort of amazing, in the time period that they graduated because so many girls were told, you're not important, you're not going to matter, you don't need to go so to school. So as, as a demonstration of sort of the size of, of what we're talking about here, now, there, now she did go to elementary, middle, and high school. Like, those were distinctions. It wasn't right. like one room schoolhouse. But like, they were all in that way. Yeah, it was all it in was, you and It was tiny. It was, right. Now, uh, she had a graduating class of, I think you said... 21. 21. So it was, yeah. it was relatively small. It was very small. And of the 21, two girls went in the service. Hmm. My mother and another one that would have now be like... That other girl was my mom's second cousin. I'm not sure how that, that worked was, out. That was public school. Or was this private? Do we know? It was public. Yeah, yes. Yeah, okay. yeah, so yeah, they went to regular regular high schools. So, and then the other thing that kind of caught me, not I wouldn't say by surprise, not off guard, but I thought was, you know, that stood out, was that she went to high school with a mix of, I don't know the best way to put this, and I, I'm sorry if I offend anyone, I just don't know the proper terminology. American. Locals and natives. All right, Native American Indians. Native Americans. Now, and I mean and then real local tribal, farmer type people. Local farmer people, which were, again, you know, as, as far as I can tell, um, you know, these people were all hardworking, very, uh, that's what I'm looking for. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, they, uh, they did everything themselves, and they did it for one another, and that just yeah, happened to work community. out. community. Right, and um, so, you know, it it's sort of, it's also interesting that uh, we come from tall families. So how I know that is that my grandmother played basketball in high school, and so did the cousin who went in the army, second cousin. So, you know, having said that, you know, these people were... Native American Indians, not so any sort other of kind. Going towards the point, like you were saying about you know people. Now this is a very, a very much a time the time we lived in thing. This was before you could order stuff on Amazon and have it delivered to your door. Grandma, or sorry, Joan's mother, my grandmother. Yes, she uh, actually made clothes for the girls. Uh, yes, I mean all the dresses looked like they were white, and they were below the knee. Uh, some buttoned down the front, some were pullover dresses, and they were nice, but you can tell by the way they all look alike that they weren't probably bought in a store. And not only that, but remember, if you remember, my grandmother, she was a five-needle knitter. Oh, yeah, yeah. Five needles, you know. She had a lot of talents that weren't considered talents when she was younger, but 
we appreciated every pair of socks she made for us because they were so thick and warm. Um, even in Alabama in the winter, we need thick, warm socks. So, um, yeah, but she, she could we used do to that. call There's those granny socks. Granny socks, yes. I, um, can you, just, just for a moment, I know we're going off the rails um, a little bit. Two things. Okay. First, uh, we need to defer to today's sponsor. We'll be right back. I'd like to thank today's not-so-video sponsor. Uh, this is definitely not a sponsored message. I have not been paid to say this. However, there are affiliate links in the description down below for a product that I have been using for years. I have loved for years. Um, full disclosure, uh, I actually uh, in some ways helped even launch this company, but I have nothing to do with it today. <laughs> um, I, uh, so the product is TubeBuddy. TubeBuddy is an amazing browser extension that allows you to do all the things as a YouTube creator that you need to do to help maximize your impact on this platform. Uh, it's something I believe in very strongly. Those of you who maybe followed me from my previous job know that I've been singing the praises of this particular browser extension, and now even they have a phone app for years. I absolutely love this, and if you were to check it out, I would very much appreciate it. I know that there's an immense amount of value out there for those of you who are YouTube content creators or you want to be. There's immense amount of value here. Um, you know, there are several different sort of tiers. You don't necessarily, you know, the great thing is, you know, it's very inexpensive to get started. They give you some great tools. In fact, there is a free version. If you want to go check it out, link in the description. Check out the free version. You never have to buy anything if you don't want to, but if you want the extra features, those are also awesome to have. Um, <clears throat> my thumbnails here on this channel are built almost exclusively with TubeBuddy. Um, the end screens that you see at the end of my videos, built with TubeBuddy. Uh, so much of my channel it has to do with this browser extension and this company. I love them to death, and it would mean the world to me if you checked them out. I'm going to stop being all sappy, but yeah, um, definitely do that. And thank you so much for watching this video, and thank you to TubeBuddy for, uh, for being awesome uh, in general. All right, cool. Next clip. And now that we're back, um, I wanted to uh, just real quick about the granny socks. I don't have a whole heck of a lot of memories. I do remember that we, some point in like the summer of every year, we would get a phone call probably from grandma or from, you know, one of your aunts, um, grandma's sisters, Joan's sisters, sorry, um, saying, hey, look, you know, the, the socks are, you know, we need to go ahead and get color orders. Right. And we could buy our own yarn. And she'd yeah. make them with that back at... All right. Whenever you'd like. Okay, so uh, the socks that my grandmother made were special because my grandmother made them, okay? Now, you can buy them. Some people make them. My friend Angela on Facebook makes them, and you can still buy them from people who know how to knit. And they can do two, one needle as well, two needles. You don't need five needles. It doesn't matter, but, you know, those people are, are few and far between now. A lot of people my age... Um, never taught their children. So my grandmother didn't teach my mother. My mother didn't know how to teach me. I can crochet, but I can't knit. And I sure can't knit socks like that. Okay, those. so move, let's, I, I'm glad we got off on that, but let's, uh, let's, so all of this stuff, the fact that grandma was helping to raise her sisters, you know, the immense responsibility there, the, the hard, you know, Taking life. Taking back and forth to church, having to work on the farm. The hard life of working on the farm, and a lot of things <laughs> led her to seek what? You, she well, wanted to join. She, she, she was sure she didn't want to live in Upper Peninsula, Michigan. She was positive of that. And though she didn't know where she did want to live, she established that, you know, she should go into, she should enlist in 1959. At 17 years old, she should enlist in the U.S. Army. She went to the recruiter. She brought home a paper for Grandma and Grandpa to sign. And it said, you agree that your daughter can join the U.S. Army. Mm -hmm. And my grandmother said, N-O, H-E double toothpicks, no. This is not happening. Yeah, no, this isn't happening. So my grandfather said, if that's what you want to do, I'll sign it. She said, I want you to sign it. And he signed it. Apparently that was all it took. But having said that, that she enlisted at 17, she turned 18 within a week or two, graduating from high school, so she actually didn't leave for uh, Anniston, Alabama basic training until she was 18. 
I think, you know, potentially one of the things that, you know, could have factored into that. I'm going to put you down on the floor, buddy, okay? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, one of the things that led to that... It's a good thing our dogs aren't spoiled. <clears throat> I know, right? One of the things that could have led to that was, you know, the fact that, you know, the girls were raised to an extent, and that Gra Grandma Signy and Grandpa Ralph, their alcohol... Right. Their, their, I won't say alcoholism, I will say alcohol consumption, right. and the ramifications thereof. Right. Were maybe more than Grandma wanted to continue. Exactly, because keep in mind, these kids, she's, she's enlisting in the army, and her youngest sister is four. Four. Because as I shared earlier, she was 14 when... when uh, Aunt, June, Aunt Jean was born, so yes, I would think that had a lot to do with her wanting to get out of town. Where else could she go in 1959 with only a high school education and get away from her family? Apparently, as Anniston, Alabama. Well, that is why she got to Anniston, Alabama. Now, that is true. We, because of unrelated things, we live in northern Alabama we now. Do. We do. Um, the nearest big, well, biggest city to us is a city called Huntsville. Um, it's known as the Rocket City, and they've got like a, a military base and stuff. But um, you and I have never been to the military training base in Anderson. Well, because they closed it. Okay. A long time ago. Well, you know, a long time in grown-up terms, not like <laughs> 40 years. But yeah, it's been a while in the base realignment and closure, which pumped money into Huntsville and pumped troops in. But, of course, that one didn't make it. But it was only for women. It was a women's base, okay. an army base. Yeah. That's where women did their basic training. So um, <laughs> I've been there, but I was there on on our way to the Gulf of Mexico one time. So you don't remember that. You so a little. now, Joan, my grandmother, your mother, really, she didn't ever tell us much about her time in Anniston. Other than... So, 1959 <laughs> happens to be a few years before 1965. And in 1965, there were... And up until then, and even then. But that was the uh, Edmund Pettus Bridge debacle uh, in Selma, Alabama, where uh, whites and blacks uh, didn't get along. And the police yeah. or whoever was supposed to be keeping the peace, used fire hoses against the black people. So, not all, to, all, even though this my mom was here before that, she could feel the racial tensions. Now, my mother didn't have any black people that she went to school with. However, if you track back earlier, I said they were Native Americans. I'm not So she talking, was used to people who were different from her. Definitely. That was normal. Yeah. It was normal to have, to go to school with, no, no, there was no, uh, so there was a tribe in Upper Peninsula, Michigan, well, there's a town, Baraga, that is run by Native Americans. They have a casino there, they own the phone company there, they do the public housing there, like, you know, you put your name on a list and you wait till your number comes up, whatever. That tribe of Indians, and that's only, that's only like 40 minutes from where my mom grew up, they own the whole town. They run that town efficiently, effectively. And they don't treat white people any different than they do their own people. I've met some of those Indians, and they are amazing, amazing people. So I, I do remember Grandma sort of talking about how, you know, um, as as a woman who didn't see the barriers between right. race and whatever, things right. were difficult because she essentially had to be taught, you don't drink from that fountain, you don't whatever. What, yeah, you know. yeah, the whole different... And, for yeah. whites and blacks, different So fountains, I do remember her talking about that, but the things that I remember most, she hated the heat, because it was a very humid heat. Yep. And this is also, I want you to keep in mind, this is between 59 and 60, their air conditioning was not nearly as prevalent as it is. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't... You got right? a fan. <laughs> and a bucket of ice cubes. That's right, that's right. Um, but uh, in addition to that, um, you know, she would tell... You know, well, I don't want to say stories, but she would always complain about the giant cockroaches. Yep. And um, we have, they're called wood roaches, I think, down here. And some of you have pinchers. Lake Michigan, we had those too, but she hated just those two inch, two inch, they're two more than an inch, or two or three inch long black cockroaches. They're horrible things. I hate them, but I hate snow. So I can live with five cockroaches a year 
if I don't have to shovel snow, and that's the trade-off I made when I moved south from Indiana where I was raised. For the record, mm -hmm. when we moved down here when you were younger, and um, grandmother would come down every winter. Do you recall I that did. she'd come down several times? I do. We're expecting snow. We're leaving in the morning. You know. So, so that, that was, extra heat came in handy. Yeah, and she, she was down here a lot. Um, so, so after she was done with, with her basic and all that, um, there, you know, there was an entirely different chapter of her life. Um, before we get to that, we're going to defer back over to another sponsor break. Um, and to those of you who, you know, have been supporting sponsors, I appreciate it. Um, I, I really do because, you know, it's allowed me to spend a little bit more time making these videos. Um, but yeah, so over to that. Anthonites, many of you know that I, over the years, have done a lot here on YouTube. And part of that is also helping other channels with their YouTube channels. Uh, no, I just said channels twice, but that's okay. Uh, many of you know that I, uh, I will work with uh, YouTube creators on, uh, on optimizing their channels and things like that. And one of the, one of the things is that I, I don't take my own advice. Uh, but one of the things that helps keep me as a creator grounded and make sure that I don't miss you know, the things that I super, super care about is TubeBuddy. TubeBuddy is an amazing browser extension and also mobile phone app that allows you to make the most out of your time here on the platform, not just on YouTube. Uh, it also helps you market yourself across other social medias. It's amazing, it's a tool I've used for years. Uh, full disclosure, it's also a tool that back in the day, and this is many, many years ago, uh, I worked with them while they were launching, uh, and I don't know, like it's got a special place in my heart. I absolutely love this service. I have been using it for years myself on this channel. Um, you know, I shared before that uh, my thumbnails are built with this tool. Um, a, a lot of times you'll see that sometimes I'll post videos to Facebook, on my Facebook page. Those are done with TubeBuddy, uh, essentially moving those over so I don't have to upload them twice. Uh, just so much. Um, it helps me stay organized. It helps me make sure I don't miss the things that I really, really care about. Um, because when you do get, you know, the several, like hundreds of comments a day, which I don't so much anymore, but I was at one point, having this tool really made the difference between being able to scale and be able to, t you know, you know uh, I guess the word I'm looking for is um, to be able to just make sure that, you know, I was there to help, you know, my fans connect with me, you know, in, in a special way. This tool is amazing. I've, uh, I don't know. Uh, Again, they are not paying me to say this, though there is an affiliate link in the description um, if you'd like to check it out. There's a free version, check it out, um, and the free version is no slouch. It allows you to do all kinds of amazing things, and you know the paid versions are even better. So please, go check out TubeBuddy, link in the description, um, and because it's an affiliate link, it might even throw me a penny or two, I, I don't know. Uh, honest to goodness, I, I don't even really like understand at this point how their affiliate system really works. All I know is that it's something I believe in, and when it comes to you know sort of this ad thing that I'm trying, I really only want to plug things that I believe in. Um, and those of you who have been watching my channel long enough know that I wear this shirt a lot. It's because it's something I genuinely care about. It's a product I really like. Anyway, I'm getting all mushy. All right, <laughs> next clip. Okay. So now that people are in the comments complaining that I'm using my dead grandmother to make money on the internet, because that's probably going to happen. Okay. So now that they're they're done making those comments, let's talk about my dead grandmother. Okay. <laughs> let's get out of that. Okay. At this point, we're really talking about my dead grandmother, my dead grandfather. Uh, okay. <laughs> now, um, so uh, so grandma, she got out of um, out of basic and all that. And then she went from here-ish all the way to Germany. Yep. Now. She was a couple different places. Okay, so um, I have noted here, because it took us a little while yeah. to sort of piece this together. Because I might have known the name of this, but I didn't know what city it was so, in. So I'm going to list the cities, and then we'll sort of talk about the memories that we have of what Grandma, you know, what she brought back. They're not the things, I'm talking about the, you know, what okay. she brought back and, and she told us. So she, uh... 
I have Patrick Henry Village in Heidelberg. She was stationed there for a while. Um, I don't know what was there, but she talked about it. And she had a jacket, a black one, with patches to where she'd been, and that was on there. So. Uh, also, she uh, uh, I have noted here Ramstein. Ramstein, which was, uh, that's probably where she took her training, because that's still an important army base for in Vietnam or in Iraq. If you get hurt and you're really injured, you're going to go to Germany first. And you're going to be taken care of by, well, triage and medics, which is what my mother did in the army. Medics, like assistant nurses, they do your triage and decide you need to go immediately or you can wait right here. They can now, give you painkillers. Another thing to note is that at the time in the military, there weren't really a lot of jobs or rates or what what you call them that a woman could do right. it wasn't nearly as open right. as it was today so right. it, her options were pretty much like medic and, and desk jobs like you know secretary for yeah. this and you know okay cater for that and then also um i think i think we said ramstein but yeah, i would ramstein. like to go ahead and point out that i'm aware that i may be mispronouncing that i've also heard it's pronounced like ramstein ramstein like, please yeah, try to kill me. It's an American German base. That's a co, a so, a co base, I think. It, actually, USAG in Heidelberg. I'm not sure if they both are, but I know that USAG in Heidelberg yes, is. Yes, that was a co base. And yeah. one of them might be closed down. That's The USAG is closed down. Yeah. We don't use that anymore. But I think everything happens Everything happens now at the big one. Which, yeah. you know, but this, this is only for the Army. I mean, I'm not including. But actually, I, I don't think it matters. If you get hurt, it doesn't matter what hospital you go to because. Marines get treated just as well as Air Force, who gets treated like yeah. Army, who gets treated like Navy and Coast Guard. Let's not forget them. So, you know, doesn't matter, but my point is she was in the Army. Mm -hmm. And so there was different jobs and different services for different people. And if she'd have gone in the Air Force, she probably could have got something else. Maybe it would have been um, you know, secretary to a preacher or something. I don't know. But I know that she went in the Army, but she knew beforehand what she was going to be. So... Now comes, um, okay, so as far as, before we get to this, this here, let's, these three things, uh -huh. before we right, get that right, far, right. Um, I remember Grandma used to tell stories about Germany. Um, she used to talk about the, the honey trucks, which were, do you remember this? Mm -mm. So she used to tell stories about, sorry, the camera cut off, so if I'm repeating myself. Um, she used to tell stories about um, the honey trucks. Now, honey trucks were human fertilizer that was actually used for fertilizer. They would collect all the dew. Porta potties, I yeah. think. Yeah. And then they would, you know, they would, uh, she used to talk about how it, uh, it made the food taste different. It made, you know, there were things like that. Do you remember all anything <laughs> she ever said about the beer? Um, no, off the top of my head. So Germany's famous for beer and beer yep. steins. And when you see a beer stein, you, if it's all fancy, you know it came from Germany. Well, you think you do. Oh, but anyway. It's styled it's like to look like. Out, right. Um, but they serve beer warm in Germany. There's other differences too. Mm -hmm. um, and it's stronger because we have laws. You know, if you're drinking alcohol and it's a... Uh, you know, point, you know, 6% by volume. Why? You're probably drunk. Oh. If it's higher than 6, you know. In Germany, wasted. they actually have laws that if it has more than the four, ba I think it's four basic ingredients, you're not even technically legally allowed to call it beer. It's beer, barley, and hops. That's the only two Bar I know. Uh, barley, hops, and there's like two others. But yeah, if, if it had like this whole like thing about apple beer and like other yeah. flavorings, they're like, no, you can't, can't do it. Well, yeah, they, they have a, a stronger beer. So what grandmother... She, she was young, and there was no, probably no 21 to drink age back oh, in those cookie. days. Okay, oh, fine. Come on, buddy. Here. Come on. Come on. All right. So there was Come probably on. no 21 to drink age back then. And if you're in the Army and you're overseas, I don't know who's going to mm. card you. But anyway, uh, she used to say that it was strong. And she didn't ever really want her beer warm when she came back to the States, but she commented on how good the beer was there. I would, like, I'd, I've never, you've got to be a beer drinker. I'm not, I could never have done a beer drinking thing. I can't do it. What are you, bro? You don't drink beer. My other son doesn't drink beer, but if you're a beer drinker, apparently there's a difference. Okay. So you want to get into these three things, or do you have any more memories you'd like to share um, of what she told us about her Well, I, I do want to share that she learned how to speak German. Okay. A lot of German, not just a little. So I, I, was, I, was like, I was like five. And yes, we had Sesame Street. So I had learned to speak 
Um, I had learned uno, dos, tres, cuatro. Well, we had learned that yeah. because it was on Sesame Street. Well, my mom decided to tell me that it's eins, zwei, that I, I can't do it now. She would tell me one through something in German. So I had no idea um, that there was an accent to go with it or what it was. I had no, you know, but she wanted me to also be trilingual at four because she wanted yeah. me to speak in different languages. Yeah. So she lost her ability to speak. I'm sure she never forgot the words or she lost her, what's the other word I'm looking for? Her, her wanting to speak. I mean, yeah. why would, you know, if you nobody don't use else it, you speaks lose it. German. Why would you? Oh, you? oh, that's it. You're, you're out of here, Anthony. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, you know, so, but when I was younger, you know, she would, she would teach me words. And I could ask her, you know, we'd drive down the road and I was a little on go, how do you say grasshopper? And she'd tell me grasshopper. Well, they had grasshoppers over there. But basically, yeah. you know, she did pick up quite a bit of it. And she was fluent in Finnish because my grandfather, Stanley, spoke spoke Finnish. So I know they were from Finland, even if my DNA says no. <laughs> but uh, she was fluent in, in uh, Finnish, not Swedish. But that's odd because that's the language my grandmother spoke almost all the time. Because if it was English, nobody knew. Yeah. So anyway, yeah, that's uh, that's interesting. Okay, so now we get into... So uh, Joan spends, you know, several years there. Um, and now we've seen conflicting paperwork on this. We, I, I feel like I have a responsibility to Joan, my grandmother, your mom. Um, I feel like I have a responsibility to say, we have paperwork, we have reasons to, to uh, we question have the accounts. paperwork, we have a, accounts that don't always add up, so... But we have conflicting paperwork. Yeah. Okay. Now, so, apparently... She may have re-enlisted into the army. No, she did, because we have the newspaper clipping. Mm -hmm. It was her hometown saying that she was re-enlisting for four more years. That means she'd gotten out and gone home, and then she was she had signed her paperwork to re-enlist, and that was a big deal back then, because, yeah. you know, what are the odds that anybody from that area is female is going to go in the army and then come home and re-enlist? Um, and, and that would have been 1963. She ended up like, she ended up re-enlisting, but still ended up coming home. And then we later on we found a DD 214, DD 214, um, which are discharge papers, and it's honorable, honorable discharge. So we don't officially know what happened here. Did she try to enlist, and somebody's like, nah, fam. Or did she enlist and then, you know, something happened? We, we don't know. Well, what we do know is my grandmother said that a, year, a few years later, they came to Michigan looking for her. But now, if that's the case... Who is they? Yeah. Um, at that point, my mother would have been living in Wisconsin somewhere. Um, we know that. She liked to stay between Green Bay and Milwaukee. She worked in both places, and that would have been in 63, 4, 5... So, so we don't we don't know. At that point, you know, this was before government records were digitized. It yeah. were were signals crossed. I I don't know. Um, I'm not gonna sit here and you know of all the things that I can pick on my grandmother about. And there are those. This is definitely one thing where I'm not willing to talk smack about my grandma until I have something proof. And we're never gonna have that. Yeah. The reason we're never gonna have that is there's so many laws. That I could come up with a thousand reasons why I need the facts about these things as her daughter. Social Security is not allowed to tell me. The military is not allowed to tell me. And even Freedom though I... Uh-uh. No, that's uh, from the government. So that... We can't get that. They have... They can give us, like, groups. How many women are in the Army? Boom. You know? Good. Gotcha. But, yeah. And, um, and even still, they, they don't... For defense reasons, so, for security reasons, they don't tell you everything. But... You know, you're never going to get the truth, no matter what. Remember so that. What we do know is that in 1967, she was on the hunt for a job. She was. So she'd moved down to the area of Gary, Indiana. I don't know right then where she lived, but I know so, that in when she made the decision, she was working janitorial in Wisconsin. Either in Milwaukee or Green Which Bay. makes sense because Milwaukee. she had a background in farm life, so she could probably right. fix and repair she could stuff. Fix and she repair could. stuff. That makes sense. Yeah. 
So she now was what doing is it. odd for her for that time, women in janitorial roles was she was probably a minority in that. Ah, and yes, but remember that in this same era, women had they wanted a job, and the government was sort of pushing employers to hire more women mm. because in World War II when all the men went off to war. They hired all kinds of women. Yeah. And the women did great jobs and held the country together while those men were fighting two different wars. So there was that push that, you know, we can work and we can be productive too. And so that was going on. So she had applied to a bunch. And, and, and the wording of what was on these applications just about killed me when we talked about this. What was the wording on the application that she sent out to all of, or that, no, well, either sent or hand delivered? Yeah. To a lot of these places. She applied to, there were so many steel mills. Now, you look, U.S. Steel, Bethlehem Steel. Um, there's probably another one I'm missing right now, but I can't remember it. Uh, the E.J.N.E. Railroad, and then those up there, up, up across the coast, even in E.J.N.E. E. was even owned by the government. It was. Point, it, was a, it was all railroads. Okay. All railroads. Um, it was like the 80s. They were sold to a Japanese firm, I think. But anyway, I don't know why. I don't understand. Why do we know that? Let's get that. We, we don't know why we know that. Um, but, so... She, uh, U.S. Steel owned dj &E in part because they paid their retirement to U.S. Steel, mm -hmm. which is sort of weird, too, up to that point. Um, so basically what, you know, what ended up coming to pass was that she, she said that she applied, she was applying to all these different places, and whoever hired her first, she would work there for the rest of her life. And in June of 1967, she started her first day at the EJ and E Railroad in Gary, Indiana, and she spent 30 years there. And she died eight years later, so it was almost the rest of her. I mean, to be fair, she uh, when she retired, she could no longer physically do the job. Right. To she, be fair. Right. She had a knee replacement. It didn't work, so the railroad put her to the physical, the same physical you take to work there, and she couldn't pass it because her knee did not bend to 90 degrees. Now, you 90 is a right angle. This is 90 position. degrees, right. Uh, you can normally sit on your calves. Her knee wouldn't even go to 90. And uh, they said, we can't take you back. But she was smart because she had her 30 years there before they decided that. So. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see here. Uh, but she still got disability from the railroad. Yeah. Yep. She still did. So, okay. Now, um, later... So... You were not even born yet. We haven't even gotten to wait, you being wait, born. Wait. In, <clears throat> when she got disability from the railroad? No, no, no. Oh, I'm oh, talking oh. about at this point in the story. Oh, yeah, yeah, she yeah. started working for them. Right. Now, there are a lot of things that we still don't know. Um, but and we have mysteries facts. Out there. But we do know that she had, uh, at one point, changed her name, for whatever reason, to... In 1967, she changed her name... From Joan M. Walls to Joan Booker, B-O-O-K-E-R. Also in 1967, she got pregnant with me. And then in 1967, she took a man up to Michigan, the UP, to meet her parents. And his name, she introduced him as Eugene Booker. Was it Eugene or just Gene? No, Gene Booker. Sorry, Gene Booker. And my grandmother remembers him, and my Aunt Jean remembers him, because my Aunt Jean was still living at home. Remember, she's the baby of the family. So now that and then my up... Aunt June got married in, in 67, and uh, her son and I are nine months apart. Now, didn't she actually come down and stay she with She went down to home? Gary. She went down. She saw Chicago. You know, it, It's like an eight- or nine-hour drive, but Chicago's there, Milwaukee's there, Green Bay's there, and that's how you follow that to get to Gary, so... Now we're recording. Sorry about that, but the camera cut off yet again. So this okay. is actually going to be a very long video. Actually, I'm sure when you're done in editing, it probably won't be. Well, I don't know, because no. a lot of this is important, and it all yeah. plays a part. So my Aunt June came down to Gary on her honeymoon with her husband. And her husband, of course, had met my mother, but, you know. So they came to Gary, and while she was there... Uh, my mom introduced her. My mom was pregnant and there. And she was big pregnant. Yeah. Well, you know, my, my mom would have been so skinny. Now, keep in mind that you and I aren't thin like that, but that all the girls, when they were young, were like size zeros. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so she'd have been three, four, five months. She'd have been like of a house, you know. But my aunt did say she was, you know, pregnant, visibly pregnant. 
and she had this man she entered you know, she she laying on the couch she introduced him his name was Gene Booker and my aunt my grandmother had already met him and my youngest aunt had already met that met him when she took him up there but my aunt June didn't get to do that she was in college I think so that's you know it's important and he looked like Elvis but why that matters is because I never met Gene Booker Eugene Booker or my father whoever he was also. Remember you said grandma was secretive? That's one of those things she took to her grave. When she died, I thought I'd find a note. I had asked Anthony, go through these boxes and see if you're safe in boxes. I, I'm not gonna go into how that happened, why he was there alone, but he was. And uh, that could be maybe a story for another day. Yeah, and she went through, or he went through some of the stuff and he found some pictures that he did bring to me from when my mom was younger. And she'd already given me her army photograph album, so I've already had that. But I, there was never a picture of my father in any baby photo or any photo with her pregnant. Those are missing entirely. So if you happen to know a Eugene Booker who maybe was in the Gary, Indiana area in 1967, I would be the person to let know that information. And also, he can't have come from anywhere except Europe because... My DNA doesn't track anywhere but there. We still aren't even to you being born yet. No, now, we're to the... She's right, so, she's pregnant. So, Gene or Eugene Booker disappeared like a thief in the night. We don't know. We don't know what happened. Well, here's what we know. Okay, what do we know? He knew my mom was pregnant. <laughs> so, so... <laughs> that we, we know. So, yeah. we don't know. And we're but not... But what we do know is that... That was probably his real name. Because she used well, it multiple times. And she changed her legal name. Never changed it back, Anthony. She, mm -hmm. her, according to Social Security, when she died, her name was Joan Booker, but it wasn't. So, what we do know is that uh, someone else sort of stepped up and helped take care of you, um, Marilyn. Yeah, Marilyn. Um, uh, may I share the last name? Yes, go ahead. Uh, Marilyn Skidmore. Right. Um, and she was actually she was uh, an ex-military person she herself. Was, uh, she had. She served until retirement, 20 years probably, in the United States Air Force. But hold that thought. They didn't meet while my mom was enlisted. Because so if she was if she was retired, that would mean that Marilyn was uh, older than Grandma. Yes. She was... It, 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 it's, it's, you know, it's a, I want to say she was born in the 30s. So she was somewhere right around 10 years older, 7 to 10 years older than okay. my mom. So that's why... She could have gone in in 47, or I'm sorry, yeah, well, you know, 50 and gotten out in 70 with 20 years. She could have gone in 55, got out in 75 or something like that. Remember, though, that I was born in 68, and I never remember her not being there. That doesn't mean she wasn't there. My Aunt Jean would be the best one to ask because my Aunt Jean spent the summer with my mom one year, and, she re and I was tiny when I was born, a summer after I was born. Um, my Let's Aunt not Jean's, get to your birth yet. Boy, Aunt Jean's never mentioned it. She mentioned being with me and my mom. She never mentioned seeing Marilyn. Other, uh, another quick thing. So we sort of skipped over something. Um, so, uh, as far as uh, the Jean or Eugene Booker thing, uh -huh. um, it's possible, of course we don't know for certain yet, that they, um, that Joan, my grandmother, your mother, uh -huh. got married to um, Eugene, or Jean, whatever, um, as a shotgun wedding. It is very possible. So here's what... Now, for those of you who don't know what a shotgun wedding is, yeah. because, look, you know what, yeah, I, it's I, an I, American thing, yeah. it's a highly... Yeah. So it, or maybe just people who have never heard the term, essentially it means, like, if I were to come to some girl's parents and say, hey, uh, Julie is pregnant. The, the thought process is the dad gets out a shotgun and goes, y'all getting married now. Yeah. But whether there's a literal shotgun or not, the idea is you got a girl pregnant, you're going to do the right thing by my daughter, you're going to marry her, and That's you don't right. have a choice. And there doesn't have to be a shotgun. A shotgun wedding is means that someone got pregnant before they got married. Mm -hmm. To that note, my grandparents were married in October. My mom was born in May, and in both of all my grand, all my aunts and my mom knew that my mom, that my grandmother was pregnant with my mom when they got married. It doesn't make sense. My mom would have been conceived in August or September. They got married in October. So, 
My grandfather would have known about shotgun weddings. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So this is more or less where we're going to cut this video off. No, this... no, no. We're just going to cut this topic well, off. Well, this topic. Um, already, but... so far, we, we've restarted the camera, I think, like five times. That's uh, 10 to 12 minutes per time. And that's still going to end up being a 30, 45 minute video. But we do have a few sort of ruminations that we'd like to go over um, based on all of this. First and foremost, if A, you have any information that may help us find my mother's father. Even potentially. Even it potentially. doesn't have to leave. Even if you happen to maybe you served with someone in the military named, you know, Gene Booker. Or, or you worked at U.S. Steel with someone, Bethlehem Steel with someone, or anyone in the Chicagoland area. Uh, or if you just have any good leads as far as places to look other than like Ancestry.com and all that. Right. Please. You no, know, I have not done 23andMe, which 23andMe would connect me with anyone who had a direct link to my Isn't DNA. Isn't that just a different version of the same DNA no, test you took? It's, no. Ancestry tells you where you're from. 23andMe takes your strands of DNA, it kind of unwraps them, and then it would say, you're, you're, you know, you're very much similar to uh, so-and-so, and I'd yeah, that is my mother's sister's daughter. And then they'd go, well, then... On the other strand, you have this, and since, you know, it, it's, it's a, uh, theoretically, uh, I have two exes, so I have one from each parent. Mom, you've but, been married multiple times, you have far more than two exes. No, I don't, I have two, two exes. Yeah, but you've been married twice, and then you've had all kinds of people you've dated, there's more than two exes. Oh, good God, we learned <laughs> all that, but anyway, listen, if you guys ever find anybody who knows anything that could lead me to my father or... My, he's, he's, he would be in his 70s, mid to late, if not older than that by now. So the odds of me finding him are slim and none. But uh, I look just like my mother, so it's not going to help you at all. Um, but I would love to find if I had sisters or brothers, and yes, we could take a... We're not going to go to Jerry Springer, but we could take a, a, a DNA test to make sure that we are, are related. If you happen to know anyone who looks somewhat like me... There you go. I don't know. Because he doesn't look just like anybody. He's yeah. not just like his dad or just like his mom. You know, I don't look like Elvis, but no, and <laughs> and he, this man that we're talking about, the Gene Booker we're trying to find, doesn't have blue eyes. Does not. Does not. Cannot. Because my mother did, my grandmother did. Uh, I don't. You see how if there's two recessive blue eyed genes, they become dominant. So he did not have blue eyes. There is a lot more to this story. Essentially, this is the story of uh, my grandmother, her mother, Joan Walls. From the time of birth up until just before, just before my mother right. is born. And there's, you know what, like I said, there are a thousand stories for everybody. And there's probably a lot that we've left out. And we're probably going to be sharing this video with other family. Maybe. Maybe. Um, other friends. Maybe. Probably. We would Thanks very much appreciate whether you do it publicly, privately, any information you can to help round this story out. Because... Even if it doesn't help us find my mother's, um, you know, my mother's, uh, you know, father, it may help, you know, my kids or my nieces right. and nephews or whatever. Um, not that I have kids, but maybe one day, who knows? Or we might not know yet. I don't know. You're um, only thirty. Something. You know what? I, there are nights I can't remember. Who knows? <laughs> there are months probably you can't really. No, never mind. Sorry. Um, but yeah, so, uh, again, thank you so much for watching this video. If you've made it this far, this deep into the video, do me a favor. I know it sounds silly. Um, include the word pineapple in your comment, um, because I know it's, I, if I can search through the comments and see the word pineapple, I know that you've gotten all the information that we've given you and that you genuinely care and that you are, you know, the kind of the fan or, or follower that I need to engage with more. Um... Do you have anything you'd like to say before we cut this off? We're going to have another video. It's going to be more in-depth, more detailed, and talk about... It's not a darker side. Well, it's a darker side of my life. Yeah, it's a different period in history. And it's yeah. a different period. <clears throat> definitely a different period in history. Um, but all of the things that we've told you, we mentioned a woman named Marilyn. Mm -hmm. um, she was pivotal until I was 11 years old when she died in raising me. She was not my mother. I guarantee you I'm my mother's daughter because I look just like her. Um, but the reason I'm mentioning this is as sort of a, if you want to watch the next video, something intriguing that might 
let you do that is that my mom was bisexual until she became a lesbian entirely. And she spent you know, the last 25, 30 years of her life as a lesbian without men at all. Because remember, she didn't need a man. She could fix her own car. She worked at the railroad. She had a man's job. She had to prove she could do it as good as a man or she couldn't have kept it back in the 60s. So and There's also a giant question mark we even made on this page but didn't talk about. Uh, somebody named John Walls. Yeah. And we don't... We're going to talk more yeah. about my mother and John Walls um, because Walls was her maiden name. And that's the name that she went back to using after... I don't know when. Yeah. I get from my birth, my birth certificate says her name is Joan Walls. So somehow that so happened. There's um, lots more twists and turns. And I think that there's a lot of things that can be taken from this story from a historical context from somebody who doesn't even give a flip about who I am or what I do. I think that, um, you know, just uh, sort of going through how certain people were treated throughout history and how they dealt with, you know, sort of who they were and that sort of thing. I think might do a lot of people a lot of good just to, to see in context how certain things make people live their lives. That's but anyways, nice. we should go ahead and uh, we should sign off. Um, you usually sign off by saying hugs. <laughs> well, <laughs> Facebook is hugs. And so my Facebook friends who see this, are like, hugs, uh, hugs are my thing. Um, but I like the ending. Be I sure to like. Subscribe, subscribe and do, and all, do all those, those things, things that, that make us love, love our, our jobs. jobs. Also, be awesome to yourself and, and amazing, amazing to, to each, each other. other. Bye. Bye.